You might have seen that a lot of different cars offer some level of self-driving tech. I know that one brand in particular likes to advertise that fact a lot, but I wanted to take a look at what real self-driving tech actually looks like in 2023. I'm in a Hyundai or Hyundai Ioniq 5, and this is the ultimate pack with all of the optional extras, including plenty of self-driving-ish type of tech. So let's take a look at it and see how it works. Now, to be clear, the vast majority of this self-driving tech mostly operates as driver aids and assistance, safety features, and is very much designed to work on more motorway driving than your sort of city driving. It is very much meant to be an assistant, not self-driving, and that's the reason why it will still freak out and disconnect, and will tell you to keep your hands on the wheel at all times, and to, you know, cover the brake, that sort of thing. Uh, and so, let's go see how all of this sort of assistant sort of stuff works on the motorway. So the first of our sort of driver assistance and aid features is the sort of lane control, where this is basically full self-driving in terms of keeping you in the center of the lane. I've engaged it, and you can see that by the green steering wheel icon on the dashboard, and while you're not meant to take your hands off the wheel, just to demonstrate that it is not, in fact, me steering, uh, keeping them very close, very, very nearby, keeping a, a watchful eye on the vehicle that is in my blind spot, uh, but it is steering. It is doing the, uh, the lane management quite nicely. It's a little bit far to the left, but uh, it is doing a decent job. Now you see the warning, keep your hands on the steering wheel. You need to sort of jog it slightly, hold it nice and tight, uh, so that it, it knows that you are still paying attention and keeping your eyes on the road, which is a key thing with this sort of uh, feature and assistance. This is very much meant to be a, let's take a little bit of your load off so that you don't need to keep, you know, perfectly eyes on the, the straight and narrow. This can do a little bit of that for you, but you still have to be paying attention. Now, the other assistance feature is the adaptive cruise control. So I'm gonna set this to 70 miles an hour, as is the speed limit on this road. And so now, uh, while my foot is covering the brake, as it always is with any level of cruise control, we're now basically not driving the car. It is keeping itself in the center of the lane and reminding me to keep jogging the steering wheel, uh, and it is accelerating and braking. When we catch up to apparently the Renault Zoe in front of us, it will start slowing down. So it has already started slowing down. We're now down to 65, 64, because the Zoe is uh, sort of behind a lorry that's doing about 60 miles an hour. Uh, and it's keeping this follow distance because that is what's set with the HDA setting on the screen. You can adjust that with a button on the steering wheel, but this is a pretty decent following distance. You can close it up or make it even longer. And that following distance is dynamic to what speed you're doing as well. Now, the one thing that some other systems uh, do offer is the ability to push your indicator and it will uh, change lanes for you. Now, if I do indicate, weirdly, it is accelerating, but <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't change the lane for you. You have to be the one to do that. And then once you've made the lane change, the steering, or the sort of automatic steering reconnects and starts steering for you again. Once you press that indicator, it disengages that steering so that you have to do it yourself. And then once the indicator is off and you're back into the lane, it will then start steering properly again for you. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that this will not do uh, like route following. You can't set your navigation and then it will change lanes. It will, you know, follow, go round roundabouts. It will take those junctions. Uh, it is very much a, this will keep you in your lane and that's about it. It's definitely a weird feeling to be driving in a car and to not be technically operating any of its inputs. I am, of course, paying attention to the road ahead and making sure that we don't hit any uh, obstacles or other vehicles or run into the barriers or whatever, but it's definitely an unusual experience for me to be having the steering wheel move on its own. Um, well, I'm sure that some people are more used to this with vehicles that do offer this kind of, you know, more self-driving features. It's definitely uh, a unique one for me uh, and a little disconcerting, especially with the adaptive cruise control that is in theory full stop and go. It's quite difficult to trust that 
it is going to stop the car. Now, I mentioned, of course, that the sort of more self-driving uh, type of uh, steering and, and lane assistance, uh, but there's actually a second kind it's more of a lane departure assistant, as in if you're you know, falling asleep at the wheel or something or other and you stray across the lines, it will keep you from going over those lines, which is a great safety feature to have. It's worth noting that it generally uh, sort of really needs the painted lines on the road to be able to do that sort of, uh, sort of tracking. Uh, if you don't have lines on both sides of the road, it will often mistake the central line for uh, one that's a little too close and it won't see the curb on the side of the road and will be more willing to push you towards the outside of the road and potentially into the curb or you know the the ditch at the side of the road it very much needs two lanes or two lines on the road to be able to do that sort of management properly and that means that you generally want to use most of these features on you know, motorways and dual carriageways like this. I must admit that the adaptive cruise control is something that I'm very much missing in, in my car, my Audi S4. It is a very nice feature and definitely adds to the sort of ability to more relax, not necessarily take your attention off the road by any stretch of means, but uh, to more sort of, <sighs> have a more relaxed drive, be able to just follow along with the traffic rather than, you know, wanting to set a specific speed, but if the car in front isn't doing the speed you're wanting to do, you have to sort of still drive manually and then you can uh, re-engage your, your cruise control once it's clear and then you've got to stop and disengage cruise control. The only thing that is a, a bit of a downside to this is that it will not change lanes for you. You do still very much have to be paying attention, which is a very good thing mind you, uh, and have the uh, sort of wherewithal to know that well the car in front is doing 63 miles an hour but I would like to do the speed limit at 70 and so I would need to indicate and then it would accelerate and carry on. Interestingly, it does seem to be very quick to re-speed up, like the car in front of us just pulled out to the outside lane and it used what felt like almost full throttle to go from 63 miles an hour up to 70 of the speed limit, uh, which is kind of surprising. A lot of cars tend to be a little bit more sedated in their uh, re-acceleration to your cruise control limit. Now, I'm not pressing the brake pedal here. This is the whole stop and go. We're now down to 40 miles an hour because there's a roundabout coming up. And while I will have to disengage, including for the automatic steering, which I'm actually gonna disengage now, uh, this should bring us to a complete stop without me having to press the brake pedal. It's always nervous to do that, but let's see. It looks like the roundabout is clear and we're actually taking a different road. So I'm interested to see what it does in terms of accelerating. So we're now onto a, a road and it is now accelerating about 50% throttle up to the, uh, the speed limit. I'm going to have to set that down to the actual speed limit of this road, but it is now accelerating rather rapidly up to that speed limit. So since we're now on a slightly smaller, more country road, we do have lines on both sides of the road. You can see from the uh, LED or the, the indicator here that the active lane sort of assistant and departure assistant is still active and it's i think because it's green it's it's in its sort of concerned state uh, we are obviously on a, a single track road or a single uh, carriageway road and so that means that it's quite narrow here compared to more standard motorway lanes uh, and what that means is that it gets a little bit more freaked out about the fact that we're this close to the lines on either side um, and does tend to want to assist so if uh, going around, once we get around this corner, I'll see, make sure that it's clear, and then I'll stray ever so slightly onto the central line. Uh, and if I let go of the wheel, you can see it's the one that's steering here. And it's giving me some beeps to say, hey, this is a bad thing. So it is the one correcting that line. Now the problem with this system is, like I said, because it needs lines on both sides of the road, while on this particular road it is perfectly happy to do that because there is a line on the left, when there isn't one, it's a little bit more aggressive in cutting you hard into the curb or into the ditch, uh, which is 
less than ideal. It very much doesn't feel like the, uh, the especially the lane departure assistant is designed for British sort of city and, and country roads, especially because of how wide the, the Ionic 5 is. It definitely fills out the lane and it doesn't seem to be very happy with that fact and so uh, I do find that with that feature enabled it's quite regularly trying to steer me away from the central you know line which in theory is a good thing but in practice is undermining my confidence in the car and the abil my ability to control it which is a relatively bad thing. One other downside to the lane sort of departure assistant is that Unlike a lot of the other controls, like the sort of automated steering and, you know, uh, cruise control, that setting is not available to turn off in, uh, you know, on the steering wheel. You have to do it through the infotainment system, and it takes something like five or seven taps to do that. And if it's being actively, you know, dangerous on a road, having that so buried in one of the settings is kind of a bad thing. The active cruise control, or the, the stop and go cruise control, is something that I would definitely use if, if this was my car. The ability for, in our case, a car just pulled in in front of us that's now doing slightly slower, and so it's slowed us down nicely, uh, and you know, it, <laughs> it is following at the, uh, an appropriate distance. That's definitely something that I would like to, to have available in my car. Uh, whereas the active steering, I think, is something that, beyond the uh, the sort of safety aspect, is something that I'm I wouldn't f feel was missing from my car. So the last of the self-driving features is all about parking, and this car has a couple of neat tricks. One of them is when I press this uh, button with a P and a camera on, if I hold it down, uh, that will give us a automated parking. Uh, system um, and so in theory if I just get real close to these uh, parking spaces and it says it's searching for a parking space we're literally on top of them it can see the lines in the middle uh, and it doesn't seem to like it I wonder if it's expecting other cars to be parked here the problem is I don't really want to test this parking between two cars so interestingly, we've just driven the length of this parking space, and despite the fact that it can see the, uh, the, the you know the parking space is available, it has not decided to uh, to park in any of them for me. Okay, we're going to try the other function, which is based on the key. It has the ability to remote start and then remote move the car. I'm going to need to go outside for this, so I'll leave the camera rolling. I'll be standing out front, and we'll see if we can make it move. So what you do is you lock the car and then you hold the start remote start button and what I'm hoping is the little grills at the front open up, the lights turn on, which they haven't quite yet, uh, and then you hold the press forward button and what should happen is the car starts up and then it starts moving. Now, as you can see from the other camera, I'm not in the car. I'm moving it with this remote. The theory for this feature is that you're parked on a really tight parking space or in your garage, and you need to be able to move the car out of its parking space to be able to get in. Now, it's a little bit temperamental. You have to be quite close to it, and I think it generally has a limit to how far it will go. So I'll see if I can put it back in the parking space now. And now we're going backwards. So again, if you want to park it in a tight parking space, as long as you line it up right, it will do it. I think it's clear that a lot of the self-driving type of features, at least that are in this car, are very much meant for motorway driving, for a little bit of assistance while you are, you know, traveling on your way. Things like the adaptive cruise control, the full stop and go is definitely nice. Although the full stop and go part is something that I still can't bring myself to trust entirely. 
It's also quite sensitive on the brake pedal. If you even so much as touch the brake pedal, uh, you know, while you're covering it, it will uh, disengage that system and then you need to take over. So something to be aware of. The lane departure warning and, and assistant was by far the most sort of frustrating aspect of that. I think that needs a bit more refinement. The fact that I think it's vision based with the camera just behind the front, uh, the rear view mirror and it clearly requires lines on both sides of the road, but is temperamental in how it engages itself throughout your normal driving. That can be a bit frustrating when you're you know, trying to avoid a pothole and then it's steering you into the ditch at the side of the road instead. For the active lane assistant, especially when on the motorway, that is a nice feature, although the fact that it requires you to uh, sort of jog the steering wheel to be able to uh, you know, make sure that it stays attached and you know stays working is a little bit of a confusing feature because it means you've got to sort of jog the car slightly uh you know to, to keep it engaged but it is a nice feature it is the sort of thing that if you do you know accidentally need to take your you know concentration off the road uh, having those things enabled will be a, a nice sort of safety net if not full self-driving by any stretch of the imagination there are also plenty of other warnings that i uh, rather can't or don't want to try and show you like the forward or rear collision warnings um, those sorts of things do come up occasionally although in my experience i've only had false positives with them so far so again that can be a little bit on the frustrating side while something like tesla's full self-driving will give you a bit more control a bit more you know things like the route following the lane changing, all that sort of stuff. I feel like a lot of these features are very much still driver assistance and aids and sort of safety features more than you can, you know, put in a destination to your, you know, sat nav, whatever, and then completely ignore the road entirely, which is, you know, the full level four or five self driving. We're very much in the assisted driving stage. Uh, and so I think that it's quite nice to have these features, especially the adaptive cruise control. That's something that I do wish I had in mind. But uh, the, even the, the extra safety features and things are nice to have. They're a nice sort of safety net. And for the sort of person who is potentially a little less uh, interested in the driving experience compared to someone like myself, this is a nice sort of backup, a nice safety net to have. And while it can be frustrating at times when you get false positives, and we definitely need some more refinement on that front, it's quite nice to see that we are evolving the, the car industry a little bit to, to make it a little bit safer and a little bit less, uh, less accident prone. With that said, that is a look at what kind of modern self-driving tech in a more average car looks like. If you're interested in seeing the rest of the tech that's in this video, I have a full video on that coming very shortly, so do hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. If you're interested in seeing the more normal car review, seeing how this thing drives, handles, the you know practicality and all that sort of stuff, then check out the At The Wheel channel, that's linked in the description or on the end cards. And if you want to see more videos like this one, uh, of course, like you said, you can subscribe. You can also check out plenty of videos on the end cards. And that's kind of it. If you want to support the channel, you can pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, support through YouTube, Patreon, or a load of other links in the description if you're interested. And otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of self-driving tech in the comments down below. We'll see you on the next video.